Com. 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 The Jam Play Podcast. Welcome to the Jam Play Podcast. In this episode, we have special guest Justin Roth, acoustic guitar finger style master. We also go on a nice turkey tangent discussing the possibility of a vegetarian Thanksgiving. And the Pandora saga continues. We continue to discuss independent artist royalties on some of the biggest internet music sharing and broadcasting services. Hope you enjoy. Jam Play Podcast, episode 13. Uh, this is Chris Lipe. This is Jason Mounts. And I'm Justin Roth. And you're from Fort Collins, and you play acoustic guitar, and you're going to be doing some lessons with us. I am. Cool. Coming up very soon. Tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a um, full-time touring singer-songwriter, um, originally from Minnesota, and I moved out to Colorado about three years ago, and uh, I've been touring full-time for about 12 years, um, being kind of these independent, self-produced, self uh, managed, self-booked um, artists, just kind of perpetually going out on the road and playing shows, promoting as much as I can. Um, and I've also got uh, a recording studio in Fort Collins, so I've been producing people there as well. Cool. As well as recording my own, uh, my last record. I just recorded and did everything there myself. And that's kind of been uh, a combination between touring and, and songwriting and uh, recording has kind of been my mo for quite some time now was That's there awesome. a uh was there or what, what's the reasoning behind uh moving from minnesota colorado was there any uh, musical reason or just change of pace or you liked it out here or well i met a woman out here oh so. there it is <laughs> there's the side story there's yeah. the side story so. and uh she reports to work at the same place every day and i do not so that was the mm-hmm. luxury of being a touring musician i said as long as i've got access to an airport or an interstate, or whatever, um, I can still keep doing what I'm doing, no matter where I am. And and uh, I lived out in Colorado about 10 years ago for about a year, and it's the outside of Minnesota, it was one of the states I tour to the most often, anyway. Uh, so I've always loved it out here. And, and the weather's better. Weather is better. <laughs> this is <laughs> Although true. Although it's cold today. A little. I bet it's colder in Minnesota. I'm sure, <laughs> I promise I'm you sure that. it is. <laughs> What's your wife do? Uh, she's a dentist. Oh, cool. Yeah. She's not Very a wife cool. yet, but... Soon. Oh, well, your significant other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, and, and you have your own recording studio. Would you say that most of your work is more artist-based, or does it kind of fluctuate between being the artist and then being kind of the producer for other artists? Artist-based meaning producing myself? Yeah. Oh, um, well, I, I produced my record there. I'm, I'm going to be starting on a solo instrumental guitar record for myself there, but, um, but those... Uh, all the records I've done before my, the one I did last year were, were all recorded with somebody else. So now I'm okay. like more producing other people, or um, um, you know, then recording them and playing other instruments on their records and stuff. Very very cool. Do you have mostly uh, local outfits in your uh, recording studio? Anybody notable or? Um, well, I just finished tracking um, for an instrumental guitar player, fingerstyle guitar player named Michael Galazian. So uh, I'm mixing his record now, and so that'll be coming out probably early 2013. Um, so he's from Tucson, Arizona. Um, and then most of the other people have been Colorado-based after that. You have a name for your studio? I actually don't right now because I did originally put it together to record my record. Right. And I wasn't even thinking of it as a uh, as a as a as uh, another business. I wasn't really planning to start promoting it. Um, but then a lot of people were asking about my record and where I did it. Right. And I said, well, right here, you know, right in my house. <laughs> the way so then they're like, well, well, I like your guitar tones or whatever. And so then people started to come in to try some stuff. And then pretty soon my, Michael Glazian from Arizona was like, your record sounds great. How about I come up and record at your place? That's awesome. And so I, that was the first, uh, and I've known Michael for years and years, um, but I, it was the first time. I wasn't really looking to like start drawing from outside of the area. I was like, I want to be available to do things locally and kind of um, at least start there. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, he's coming from out of town, staying with, you know, staying uh, at the house for like two weeks. And we just kind of go at it every day. And it's awesome. so it kind of just turned into that. And it was a, a great, a great discovery that, oh, this could, I could just keep doing more and more of this. So 
Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so but it's, I have to balance it because I still do go on the road. Right. So I'm not like, it's not my main thing all the time. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of nice to have that mixture of the, of the yeah. two. Yeah, that's really cool. So walk us through the studio a little bit. What do you use? Do you have like a drum room or a guitar room? How do well, you... it's, it's, in, <clears throat> it's in my house. And so, like I said, I originally just set it up <laughs> to record myself. Yeah. And I'm just a solo artist um, and not really, you know, wasn't looking to, to record um, a band, a whole band sound. I mean, to, right. it was just to do things one at a time and layer. And so it's just one room. And, um, you know, it's like I put in wood floors and treatment treatment in the room and stuff. Cool. And got the room sounding nice. And um, so I'm, I'm really kind of geared towards, because of the world I've been in with being a solo performer, is like songwriters or instrumentalists, like solo performers yeah. or duos. You know, not, somebody wants to bring a drum kit in my house, it's not going to work. Sure. And that's, I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> well, there's I so like many the, songwriters that just, they, they just want a good, clean setup to get their, get yeah. their stuff down and... Yeah, but then I'll go in and I'll I'll record electric guitar and bass and percussion and whatever else is needed. Or if we need somebody else that plays something that that I don't play, then yeah. bring those people in. But it's just kind of things one at a time. And um, using a Pro Tools rig and um, and uh, so it's a small setup, but it's uh, but I I love what I'm able to get there. That's cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, it's amazing what you can do these days with uh, just simple tools. I mean, stuff that 10 years ago was outside of the purview of, uh, you know, normal people. I mean, all you had was, uh, you know, you had Pro Tools HD setups back then, but I mean, you're talking six, seven, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for a rig, you know, you're, right. th mm -hmm. that's a car, that's a car payment, you mm -hmm. know, and they, and they don't have financing plans, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you know a Avid doesn't finance your purchase. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing how, uh, I mean, now what you've done, like you've spent money and, and certainly for your, for your career, it's, yeah, it's a tax write-off and whatnot, I gotta, mm -hmm. you know, make this album, stuff like that, and then um, all of a sudden it's a, uh, you know, from a business perspective, it can work for you as well. Yeah, it's been, it's like, again, I, I kind of got it originally going, oh, I'll work on demoing my songs and then I'll go to a studio. And the more I demoed, the more I liked the sounds I was getting. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, I can do everything here in the, you know, in the comfort of my own home. And all the while, you know, it's like, then you, then you enter into that learning curve of, right. of how much there is to learn about it. And, um, but then learning how powerful the tools are that you, mm -hmm. that Pro Tools in and of itself, you know, and then I started to accumulate um, other preamps and other gears and, and um, other mics and all this stuff and starting to try things in all sorts of different ways. The more people you work with, you know, you st I, I went into it knowing the sound I was after and now when somebody else comes in, like, I'm looking for this. And then every, every new, every new, every session is a new learning opportunity. And that's exciting for me because I've, as a touring for so long, I love to tour, I love to perform, but you kind of go out and you do what you know. You know, it's not necessarily, aside from the audience dynamic, it's not necessarily a learning experience every time. And so now here being able to make music with other people and every every time I'm doing that, it's a, a learning opportunity. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent. We, I mean, on the jam play forums and stuff all the time, everybody's always, always asked, like, well, you know, like, I want to get started recording, stuff like that. And I'm a huge, and Chris knows this, I'm a huge proponent. I'm like, get yourself an M-Audio fast track. Get yourself a copy of Pro Tools and the Planet Waves bundle, and you're golden. Like, those those three items If you right want to learn. Yeah. If you want to learn, they mm -hmm. will expand, and, and those will take you from the very, very beginnings um, all the way to near pro-level sound and... Uh, uh, and mix downs, and it's just it's amazing what you can do so cheaply now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and then and then those steps up from there, whether it's in gear or, or whatever, um, you know, it's it starts to split hairs. There's there's a difference, but it's yeah. a lot less noticeable to a larger population of listeners. Right. And since um, everybody's listening to MP3s anyway, that's yeah, that's the other thing you can spend all this money and time on getting the perfect sound and then somebody listens 
to your album on laptop speakers. Yeah, and on it's, YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> or on YouTube, yeah, yeah, stream, yeah streaming stuff. It's, so it's, everything gets changed, and, yeah. and that's nobody's fault. It's just, it's just the reality of it. You know, it's that. always been that. I mean, it's been that way for a long time. You mm-hmm. could always get you know, the, the better CD quality sound or whatever 10 years ago, but mm-hmm. it would show up hyper-compressed on the radio with static in the background. Yeah. You know, so it's just kind of a different. The deliverables are different, but you still yeah. have the same issues. You know, it, mm-hmm. it makes me it makes me wonder. And this, it never really went a- anywhere. But I thought I thought it was going to be like the next thing. Whatever happened to DVD A? Yeah, or SACD. I mean, both of those are. Yeah, mm-hmm. I actually had um, I had this uh, album it's called This Binary Universe that actually came with DVD A. When uh-huh. it, you got a, you got a CD, it was it was this collaboration between BT and a whole bunch of uh, different video uh, videographers and stuff. He created this uh, this soundscape album. It's like basically like seven lullabies, and then um, he had uh, digital artists create motion to it and everything. So you had you had a CD with all the music, and then you had the DVD, which is the music to the to the movies, and then you right. had the DVD A, which was super high quality sound. And I, the difference was in, was immense. Oh, it was awesome. Hmm. It was immense. But well, he, they encoded it for multi-channel. It wasn't just stereo, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Five one. Yeah, it was yeah. five. It was five one sound. minimum. And it just, it sounded amazing. And, it, and an album like that really needed that. It, it just in the stereo landscape, it just doesn't, it's still awe-inspiring, but it's just not what it could be. But it never, it never took hold. No. I, you know, I, I heard, I think it was DVDA. It might have been SACD too, but uh, I heard uh, a, a good portion of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon um, on, on that format. And it was in a recording studio, and they just had it wired up, and you just kind of sat in the sweet spot, and mm-hmm. got to listen to it, and it was so cool. I mean, but you know, I think some of those formats and Blu-rays kind of gone that same way. Like, I think the average the average guy just would rather have portable, let me listen to it whenever I want kind of thing. And that that kind of format has taken over so much that these kind of elitist formats. I mean, how, when was the last time you rented or bought a Blu-ray? I, well, yeah, I, I shoot, and you know, I used to pride myself on my uh, on my movie collection, and it was something that that I really strived for. And I was like, no, I've got a Blu-ray player. I'm going to buy Blu-rays. It's the best quality that you can get right now. Yeah. Outside of, I mean, there there are some really upper end uh, type stuff, but right now your standard TV that you can buy at Best Buy is still, regardless of whether it's 80 inches or 24 inches, it's 1080p. You know, that's that's all you get. So there's only so much you can do with that, but but yeah, now I just Netflix everything or Amazon Instant Video everything, which isn't right. Which Apple isn't TV, I mean, but that's okay. I mean, you you like the story and it's good enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do, you, yeah. do you rent Blu-rays or buy Blu-rays or just Netflix? And yeah. I don't. We don't even own a TV. Okay. Because on purpose, just right. to like, don't want to get sucked into that. But it's a, uh, you know, we we have the nights around around the coffee table with the laptop and right. That's it's cool. It's like. It keeps us from zoning out on the on the TV all, yeah. all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we made the decision to get rid of the the TV hook. We still own a TV, but it functions mm-hmm. kind of like a computer. You know, we just use Netflix and stuff like that. Yeah, which is now so why free. we're considering getting a TV so that okay. we can, when other people are over, they don't have to huddle around. Alone. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, a lot of people are doing that. You know, uh-huh. just getting rid of the the drone of TV and advertising in the living room or whatever. But yeah, that's I mean, that's what's great about. It. Netflix or anything like that. It's like yeah. just watch the show you want to watch and be done with it. You don't have to sit there. Now it's like when I get around TVs and the commercials, they just drive me nuts. Oh, yeah, I've, yeah. I've kind of I always knew that, but you forget when you haven't seen them, and then you go back to it and you're like, no, nope, I don't need I don't need TV channels. No. Yeah, I was I was over at uh, a friend's house uh, yesterday. I normally uh, am in Denver on uh, Wednesdays, but uh, had some obligations that kept me here, and so I was like, man, I'm I'm bored. And I don't watch. I own a TV, and I do have I do have cable, but I don't watch live TV hard, hardly ever. Actually, I just can't. I I can't just sit there and just watch TV. And so I was over at a friend's place, and they were watching. What is it? Um, Moonshiners, something like that on on. Uh, I want to say it's History Channel. And I was asking, like, I was like, oh, what's what's this? And and. Uh, and my friend was like, "Man, you need to watch more TV." I'm just like, "No, no, it's, I don't. Yeah, it's just, it's just not going to happen." Well, th- this may be a little tangent, but the now for me, I've realized the the argument for as a musician to pay attention to some TV stuff is is okay. Um, you know, touring is one way a form of income. CD sales, your music sales is another. TV licensing 
is a, oh, is yeah. another big thing. And I just had my first placement this um, last February. Oh, cool! I had a, a song used on the soap opera, The Young and the Restless. Nice. So if you if you go to YouTube and look up Justin Roth, Young and the Restless, you'll see the the scene um, with with the song of mine and um, and. So there's there's shows like like Grey's Anatomy and that oh, kind yeah. of stuff that can break artists because of a song being used in a scene. Right. Um, so that's like that's another where it's like I should watch a little more TV to kind of see what's what's hitting yeah. what's hitting in the TV market for how music gets incorporated. Into but you know it. you still don't need to watch like live broadcast TV. You can see the shows on. You can still see it on Netflix. Or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But you don't get just the, pay attention. And a lot of it, like uh, every time iTunes uh, or the iPod gets advertised, and they they're always pulling some some artist for that. You know, they had their um, their silhouette campaigns there for a while, and I mean, huge bands got that you know basically came out of nowhere simply because of iTunes advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, from that standpoint. So there's there's certainly you know certainly uh, some um, some good that comes with that. And I mean, I've been seeing with anything technology related. They're, I mean, they're grabbing up songs and artists left and right. Absolutely. Instead of, you know, instead of saying, you still see some of it, but instead of saying, well, I want a, long, a song that sounds like this, so they go to, like, a library company that does, like, sound-alike stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, let's just grab licensing for this song. This song is awesome. You're seeing more of that. Yeah. I mean, I think even <clears throat> six or seven years ago, the the bent was more like, oh, let's, let's go with sound-alikes or let's... Um, and I suppose it depends on the budget and the type of program or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I really feel like now the the real custom music, you know, they're looking for their song mm -hmm. as opposed to licensing something else that, you know, has already been used somewhere else. Well, and there's there's been now there's been like lawsuits and because there's uh, I don't know the company that was using it, but they had they have like some black keys sound alike band that basically like we want a song like this black keys song and then they do one that's like a slight deviation and so now i think black keys are i think she said they've had to do this a, a few times they're you know suing some people because they're like you're basically doing our song <laughs> with slightly different words and maybe a couple chord changes and you're and they're producing it the same way they have similar timbre of voices it's very intentional to be a sound alike yes. um not just someone who's similar to it's like right. it's trying to clone and yet just barely deviate enough. Yeah, to, it's to... it's a it's a morality deal because I mean if you if you read the the letter of the law to you know to the the degree that it is you know there's there's some room for that and there's some room for some of that sound alike interpretation mm -hmm. but it's <clears throat> it's kind of like, it's kind of like us obviously we we teach songs on on the site, and we have to pay royalties for those songs. We don't get to just do it for free. Um, and people have asked us, and you know, because of that, it does limit what we can and can't do. Look, if a publisher says no, or they won't work with us, legal, legally, I mean, yeah, we could still put Chris in, you know, in the uh, the studio chair, and you could produce a lesson, and we could put it up. And you know what? Maybe we get caught. Maybe we don't get caught. But <clears throat> doesn't make it legal. But so people have asked us, just like, well, you know, like, to get around this, like, why don't you do, like, sound like stuff? Why don't you do the song, but, like, make it a little bit different? Which we have. Which... Done in the style of kind yeah, of lessons Yeah, well, they, that, doesn't, that doesn't do the actual song, though. I mean... No. There's nothing, there's nothing illegal about breaking, breaking down how somebody plays something, you know, looking. It's like, well, they prefer this type of chord progression, or they use this technique right. type stuff. There's, you know, that's basic music stuff that everybody is going to learn. We just summarize it but as far as like an actual song goes if we were to make if we were to take uh songs like okay well we don't have licensing for this so but we want it so let's go ahead and let's change a few things here and there let's make it so that within the quote unquote letter of the law we're okay mm -hmm. and then put it up but what that does is that doesn't that doesn't garner any trust with the actual publishers that we work with you know, it's seen as a blatant moral violation of, like, it's like, hey, you want this song, but you're not willing to actually pay for it, mm -hmm. so instead, you're actually going to go around and change it just enough to where everybody knows it's still that song, Yeah. but it's not that song anymore. And that's, that's a trust issue to where, you know, we fight with publishers every day anyway. If we start doing that, then they just absolutely said, no, like, you know, you guys are 
clearly, you know, trying to use loopholes and everything. Uh, and at that point, that doesn't make anybody want to work mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose this is sort of different, but a couple of years ago, they had the Joe Satriani and Coldplay deal. I don't know how familiar you guys are with that, but Coldplay did this song and came out and everybody thought it was well, great. Was it Viva La Vida? I I think, think yeah, I think song. so. Yeah. And <laughs> Satriani was like, excuse me? <laughs> mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you go and li you listen to the both of them and they're so similar. I mean, the, the progression and the, the textures and stuff like that are, are so similar. And mm. I don't remember the outcome of that. I never heard. Um, I, rem I remember it, but I never heard what the outcome was. It was probably settled out of court. I think what happened was is they determined that it was an accident. Because um, it was it was very Satriani, but it was also very Coldplay. I mean, they, they both just happened to kind of do something so similar because mm. their production was similar or something. But okay, um, but yeah. So you so you got your first one on a soap opera. What are you? Yeah. What's your ultimate? If you could have a song on, what would you? Well, the first go to just be given that their reputation would be Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, you know that's that's the one I think that has done a lot for a lot of artists you know far far beyond any other one that I'm aware of um but I know like you know One Tree Hill and um stuff on the CW network I, you know I think I've had friends who've gotten placements that have done some good things for them but but none to the degree that like a, a Grey's Anatomy placement would would yeah. do and so your main instrument is acoustic guitar right yeah and you also play electric in primarily in studio I, i'm not going to take it on the oh, really? on okay. the uh on the uh stage i started on electric when i was in in junior high and uh -huh. that was that was listening to satriani and steve Vai and eric johnson and and heavy metal shredders and i i learned pretty quickly that i loved guitar music but that i wasn't a shredder yeah. so um and uh so it was, it was more rhythm at that point and then i then i migrate started getting into acoustic music and uh found um i went to see crosby stills and nash and uh and there was a guy opening for him that i had never heard of before um his name was michael hedges and i was like oh who's this guy and he came out and he started his first song and i it just completely floored me and completely changed my entire outlook on the instrument and the acoustic guitar, what huh. it's capable of. Um, and that was kind of, to me, it was kind of like when you hear, you know, people of our parents' age talk about seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. We're right. like, wow, I've never heard music like that. And that's what that was like for me, um, seeing the acoustic. And then that was a thing where it's like, it's not about how many notes you can play or how fast you can play. It's like there was this whole other layer of texture and um, harmonic structure and... Um, percussive techniques and stuff that were uh, I'm, that I've that I've grown to be far more drawn to more the texture than the amount of notes. Yeah, and there's 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 definitely some commonality. I mean, we we had Trace Bundy uh, in, and he did some uh, some lessons with us. Mm -hmm. He talks about the same thing. He learned guitar, and the one of, like the first song that he learned, him and his brother, they went and got a like learn Metallica book, you know, and mm -hmm. they were you know like, oh Metallica and shred. And you know, you guys, you know, stylistically are similar. Mm -hmm. You know, um, obviously everybody has their own unique flair. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some commonality. You know, talking with uh, Mark Cruz as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, same thing. Very much into uh, you know early into um, you know rock styles and stuff like that, and just kind of gravitating then towards uh, you know acoustic guitar spe specifically. And you guys don't necessarily have like a you know some people call it lap tapping. Mark calls it extreme folk guitar. There's, you know, it's just it's just one of those. It's that style that was everybody goes back to Michael Hedges. They say like I, I saw Michael Hedges and it's just like, he he by far is the king king of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I know there's predecessors Leo Kotke and John Fahey and stuff for finger style, but the textural playing and stuff. Uh, I, Michael is the is the king of it and. I've heard. I also heard other players kind of claim like, "Well, they just kind of made this up," and you're. I was like, "No, no, you didn't." <laughs> so, yeah, it's cool. When Hats so much, off to Hedges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when <clears throat> excuse me, when so when it when a style points back to, you know, one or two artists, mm -hmm. so blatantly, I, you know, it's like Clapton constantly 
saying, well, you know, if you like me, go listen to all the, those original blues guys. You yeah. know, go listen to Tebow. Go listen to Chuck Berry. You know, all those. And yeah, I mean, Chuck, Chuck Berry is one of the, we've got, we have all these in the style of series. And literally probably half of them, anything that has any sort of blues aspect to it whatsoever, the Rolling Stones, like Clapton, uh, you know, all, all of these guys, uh, they all credit Chuck Berry. You know, every single one of them. Of course, Chuck Berry will, you know, credit someone, you know, somebody else, and they'll credit somebody else. And it's just, <laughs> it's a... It, Music is never, derivative. Right, it's, it's mm -hmm. derivative, and everybody kind of takes what's already there and just builds on it, and it just metastasizes, um, but in a good way, you know, because there's... You know, there's a there's a ton of like really just awesome music out there that draws on stuff from the past. You right. Know? Mm -hmm. That's um, what makes it good. You know, no matter what you like, if you like, okay, for for instance, if you like R and B, like hip hop stuff, there's a ton of sampling stuff that draws on the past that you hear it and you're like, oh man, I, I recognize that song. That you know, that's that's kind of cool, like how they like took that and changed it or whatever. Um, you know, same thing with... Uh, it's like with Bob Dylan's entire career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not entire, but a uh, majority of it, especially the beginning. It's just, you know, it's like, oh, I'll take this blues song and I'll play the blues song, but I'll change the words. And Well, look at Led Zeppelin 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they really ripped off <laughs> a lot of those blues guys mm -hmm. and just put more distorted guitar in and, mm -hmm. and faster notes and stuff like that. But, um, and, it, and it was... You know, it was original for its, um, for the way they presented it. But you can you can totally hear those roots, mm -hmm. and even lyrically, you can hear the hear the roots a ton from what you know Robert Plant is singing on those mm. first couple songs, or first couple albums. Speaking of uh, Led Zeppelin, I, we we had this in our in our old studio. We had the uh, the picture of Led Zeppelin, and they're all um, kind of leaning on the uh, the wing of their airplane. At the time, well, it, somebody had taken taken that picture and they put one of those like motivational poster quotes thing yeah. on mm -hmm. it. I saw this the other day and it got it got me a, a chuckle. And the the caption on it was, "Oh, your uh, your band has a bus. That's cool. Mine doesn't." And they're all like leaning oh, yeah. against their airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so you say that you're you're on the road quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What um, would you say? Like, how often are you out on the road? I mean, is it a um, well, it's, uh, I used to go out and do, um, I mean, I know people who kind of live on the road, and, and yeah. I, I wasn't um, ever doing that, but I was doing about 130 shows a year a for, a, for a majority of the last, well, probably, probably at least the last eight to nine years, and in the last few years, I've tapered it back um, just to more balance. Like, when I was in my 20s, I'd, I'd go live in my van and yeah. play every night and go all the way across the country and... Uh, for weeks on end and now I'm now I kind of like I like to have a little more balance and uh -huh. uh, so I do about 100 shows a year now and, and what that, does that look like is it uh, what kind of venues do you like to play listening rooms mm -hmm. primarily so cool. the combination between you know like like ticketed folk clubs or folk acoustic concert series and uh, a combination of uh, a lot of house concerts I don't know if you're familiar with that it's people actually host the concert in their home they have a, like a door charge or a suggested donation so it's still um the typical home could get in, in a in a any particular living room can get like 30 to 50 people mm -hmm. seated and it's sometimes it's like this potluck thing and then it's like a two set concert seated quiet cool it's not like music with a or a party with music it's actually a sit down concert and um they're kind of primarily promoting it to their friends or their community um some of which may have heard me before some of which are saying wow this house a concert in your house that sounds like a really unique idea yeah i'll come pay you know 15 20 dollars whatever it is to support their friend who's putting on this event and to see music up close and they're kind of trusting their their friend's music taste and say well if you say this is you think I'd like this? I'll I'll come check it out because I've never seen music in this intimate of a setting. So it becomes kind of like this: the music is part of the draw, but the experience is also part yeah. of the draw. And so it's really fun to play those kind of shows. Um, not only not not only because you can get paid for it, but and that people are listening. But it's because the audiences tend to be more curious. Uh -huh. They're not like jaded music fans um being like well i know what good music is or i i know what i like and i know what i don't like and i'm going to sit here with my arms crossed and 
you know, figure out whether or not you pass my bar. Right. It's it's such a unique experience. It's it's kind of playing concerts for the non typical music fan. I would say at least half of them are the non typical concert goer. That is so cool. Because they're just like there for the experience right. and then you win them over from that. And yeah. I mean granted you gotta bring the goods, you gotta do a good show and everything. But um but those those audiences are more curious in there and because they're at their friend's house they don't feel like they're in a dark room with people surrounded by people in the audience that they don't know so they're like uh, like too embarrassed to to say anything or to ask a question but this becomes a lot more interactive people ask questions and uh-huh. there's jokes that go around the room and and it's so it's really fun for me to have an audience that's so open and yeah. You know, they they're all in one way or another connected to each other because they all know the host, but they're overlapping circles of friends, and so they're they're more interactive with each other. You know, when when they have the opportunity to be, and then it's just more free to like to laugh. Even I think they're yeah. So it's it's a it's a really yeah. Unique... I've been I've been seeing a ton of that. I know DJ Phillips, who is one of our instructors as well. Uh, he's done a couple. Uh, himself, and so it's definitely something that I've been seeing more of. I actually haven't mm-hmm. really heard of that. That really, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's been. I want to say that I started seeing some of that stuff pop up about a year and a half ago, and I'm I'm assuming it's probably been going on longer than that. Oh yeah, that's that's about the time frame that I saw uh-huh. some of it popping up, and, and it's an intriguing idea. I mean, I think for myself as 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 an artist or like a musician, that would be more, at least on my end, like. It's like wow. It's like I've got a house gig that I'm doing, and it is. It is. It is probably one of, if not the most intimate setting that Mm -hmm. that you could possibly do. And like, man, like the pressure to bring your A game for something like that has got to be immense. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it's. I mean, I I I don't feel more nervous doing those. I feel more relaxed because you put so many venues will put music in the worst possible scenario right. you know like you know it's like playing at a bar there's nothing there's nothing wrong with playing at a bar you can have a good time doing it you can't get a raptured silent audience to hang on every note and every word no. at a bar because that's not people that go to the bar to hang with their friends and oh cool there's music right um right. it better not be too loud or horrible so that yeah I can so that i can't talk to my friend right. yeah so um i i feel like I can just settle into what I do at those kind of intimate shows because I don't have to fight the environment, um, which is why I just I just pretty much exclusively play listening rooms because it's so much easier yeah. for me uh, emotionally. Or you know, it's just like I'm not I'm not up against this din mm-hmm. of of noise. So um, do you still play weddings or receptions or? stuff like that too or are you yeah. mainly going for the captive audience oh, i mainly go for the captive audience but i'll have like fans of, of my music who will ask me to play their wedding and if, and yeah. if the date works out and all the logistics and money and stuff I'll, i will still do that yeah you know that's really really cool so well and with your with the way you play too you know not every artist can can do a listening room or <laughs> you know because they're... it's a i mean it's it is a i mean style wise it's like Acoustic music more or less lends it to it, but if you're gonna be, if you're gonna have people literally sitting, you know, front row will be less than distance from me to you. Sometimes, like f- maybe like four feet in front of me is the front row. Uh huh. Um, if I was just to like rock out and scream and shred, like it, you just have people just kind of in, being taken aback. Right. So the thing that is really great about it is that you can't do in you know, like bars and stuff, is you can do the songs that are so spacious and so gentle and subtle and they hear all of it. Yeah. You know, and then it makes them like lean in instead of like being right blasted back. So, um, but I mean, I, I know that like bluegrass bands and stuff that do it and, huh. and so it's not to say that it's, they're mellow. I'm just saying it's a, uh, for this indie folk, fingerstyle guitar however else you want to describe what is that i do it works really well in that listening setting but you know you throw me in a room where everybody like wants to hear covers they want to rock and they want to raise their beers in the air i'm not 
yeah. maybe not the guy for that. Yeah. You know? And that's a whole other skill set right. and style of music and power that that kind of music has sure. for that kind of environment. So, so when you're in these listening rooms, do you, do you have a, a PA or anything? Or do you just literally show up like you did today with your guitar and you? Um, I know a lot of performers that will just play them acoustically. Uh -huh. And you can do it that way and you can still hear stuff. But because of the fingerstyle guitar stuff that I do... Um, depending on the room sometimes you walk into a room and it's uh you know carpeted and carpeted or low ceilings and it's not that live of a room the thing the first thing that disappears is the subtlety and the nuance mm -hmm. in playing and i think in, in the way that that i play uh, and it's not every song but um the nuance is what makes certain songs really special and so um i want that to be heard it's not about being loud in a room but it's about having the sound go to the, the, the listener's ears as opposed to them having to lean in to, to, to get everything. So I'll usually use um, a small PA. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I my whole pickup setup, um, I, have, I have a custom setup in there to try to get this um, really full low end. So to have that acoustically a guitar, you, you fall in love with the guitar because of the way it sounds when you play it acoustically when you're at the store. Um, and then when you go out and play live, um, it's so often people will go out and plug this beautiful guitar in with the bad pickup, yeah. and then all of a sudden it sounds like garbage. Yeah. Um, so I've spent a lot of time working on customizing my guitar sound. And so, um, so having that fullness, that really big full spectrum, and, um, and having that low end that really fills the room. So uh, that's why I like to use the PA as well. And, right. and I... I always like to play if I've got a sub, which mm -hmm. which you normally think of, well, the subs in a PA are for the, the kick drum and the bass player. And it's like, no, not, not, <laughs> not for me. Guitar. Not when it's, that <laughs> was me. I'm assuming your setup is a stereo out then. Yeah, stereo out. Two, se two separate sources. Um, I've had, I actually have three sources in there, but right now I only use two. One that does all low, primarily low end and the other one that does primarily high end. So most guitar pickup setups are, if they have a dual source, they have... You know, like a, a saddle pickup or something, and a and a mic or mm -hmm. something similar to that. But you're, so, you're separating it out frequency wise. Yeah, because oh, they'll, cool. they'll just then all you have control of is the blend, right? How much of each, and then you send it out. And if you like, oh, I want more low end. You add more low end. You're, that means you're adding it to the pickup and to the mic, and the mic then is yeah. going to you know right. feedback on yep. you. So this way, I can have one magnetic pickup that does all the low end, which a magnetic pickup on its own doesn't sound very acoustic. Right. It sounds like a magnetic electric guitar kind of pickup mm -hmm. but i roll out all the high end and use it just for primarily low end because cool. it's big and warm and it's not a live source like a microphone is so that yeah. it doesn't have the feedback problems great nearly idea. as much and then i use a, a contact pickup which is uh just like a little transducer about the size of a nickel that pick up, picks up the vibration of the top of the guitar. So it gets all the woody sounds and all the natural uh -huh. sounds. And that's primarily all the sparkle and high end and air. Cool. And then uh, and then a little, and I've got a separate EQ for both. And then I, on the contact pickup, I also do a little bump in the low end for any palm thumps, uh -huh. uh, different percussive things that I do. It'll get that as so well. Do you go into a pedal, do you have some kind of pedal board that with your EQs on it or do you do all that at a board and then, or? I have a, I have a, a stereo preamp that has okay. its own EQ for two, two separate channels and then it blends to and go what, out. What kind of guitar did you settle on after playing many in the store? Um, well today I brought my breed love, ah. um, but um, this is, I've had this guitar for about 15 years and uh, it's a breed love C2 cedar top cutaway kind of grand concert size i've always been uh, i have three acoustics and they're all grand concert size and i've just always been drawn as aesthetically and just size wise and i know more people who have played dreadnoughts or jumbos who end up getting shoulder problems oh, or yeah. elbow problems and so ergonomically it feels really good um but my other main guitar is a taylor um 812 okay another grand concert size um and so just acoustically, these two guitars are very different, um, and uh, but I love that the, the Taylor is really really punchy and crisp, and this Breed Love is a little more delicate, but a really warm, open low end. Mm. So very it's cool. I have to be careful going into guitar shops because you can fall in love so fast, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 
leave the credit card in the car. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> no You're method like, well, of here's payment. a guitar that does this thing that my other guitars don't. How many and guitars do you have? Only only three like um, nice acoustics. Yeah. Uh, the other one is a custom um, autumn guitar by a guy I know in Minnesota who built it, and then I actually have a guy in Fort Collins right now who's building me a harp guitar. Oh, cool. So that'll be that'll be four. And then I've got like a little classical guitar and, you know, some electric and just some other things that are more tools than, sure, than road worthy yeah. things. So yeah, very cool. Awesome. Well, should we segue into some news? I suppose we should. I think it's news time. All right. So um, one of the things our uh, our Pandora saga, if you guys have been listening over the past several uh, podcasts. So we, we've been talking a lot about uh, you know, Pandora versus Spotify, and, you know, we've been talking about compensation of internet radio, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I pulled a, uh, I pulled a Reuters news source, um, Billy Joel, Rihanna, Missy Elliott, there's all, there's honestly a whole host of them. Um, they're not, they can't really sue about it, but they're really fighting, um, Pandova, uh, Pandora over Pandova. <laughs> Pandora. <laughs> Um, over their support of the uh, the Internet Radio Fairness Act, which is uh, which is going through uh, Congress right now, um, and they're obviously they're they're worried about compensation with uh, with Pandora and stuff. What I, I couldn't find a whole heck of a lot of informa information on that act, but basically what it seeks to do is bring payment structures of internet radio sources in line to what radio pays. Ah. Which is significant. Which is significantly less. Yeah. Um, you know, internet radio is saying that, you know, we're basically the same thing as uh, as an actual radio station. People are listening to us. You know, every radio station is like has a um, a theme. You know, uh, here in Colorado, ninety three three. That is your kind of alternative rock. Station KBPI is your hard rock, your metal. You've got a host of country stations. Uh, you've got um, uh, KBCO, which is kind of indie type stuff. Um, and so they're all kind of like you know different, you know different themes and whatnot. And you get the same thing with Pandora. You put in an artist, and they give you a radio station based on you know that type of music. Spotify, of course, is a little bit different since you kind of select what you want to want to listen to. So that uh, that Internet Radio uh, Fairness Act, they're aiming to bring the costs that they're having to pay in royalties in line with what uh, radio stations have to pay. Which, of course, if they're paying less in royalties, that cuts into what artists are making, of course. Uh, and, you know, we deal with some of that, too, with our, uh, with our royalties. And what it is, and I'm surprised that this doesn't come into play, it's based on, um, you know, most favored nation clauses. Hmm. Where it's, say, if you're, giving, if you're giving one company a better deal than you're giving me, at least as far as, you know, um, as far as those clauses are concerned, that's, you know, those are clauses that are put in there to, you know, protect businesses from unfair practices and stuff like that. So... I don't know. It's like I, I, on on the one hand, now I'm sure I'm sure Rihanna, Billy Joel, I'm sure they're you know decently well off. Do they, you know, it's it's one of the, it's one of those things. But at the same time, you have to look at uh, artists as a whole. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, artists that are on Pandora stuff like that that are not huge grossing artists that uh, that liter literally you know make their living what whatever that is. It may be, you know, it may be um, poverty line on stuff like that. And if you're reducing their costs as well then yeah you know where do you fall is your music on spotify pandora yep it is yeah both yeah i'm both oh, cool um i i don't know much about this this uh this 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 bill or the act um, yeah and, and i couldn't find much information the on thing it. i wonder about is if they're saying they're paying more than than radio stations that's what's saying the internet's Right. To pay more. right. It might it might have something to do with the fact that when it's digital broadcast, it all has a digital fingerprint, and it's easier to mm -hmm. track exactly what's being played on the internet. And while, like uh, for royalties for the the performing rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, CSAC stuff right. like that, they only do a sampling of stations. 
where they're actually like sampling, looking at playlists. And then they may have some algorithm that determines, well, if they're playing this much of these artists, then they're, these other artists are probably getting played this much. And mm -hmm. um, But the amount that each of those um, performing rights organizations sample the stations are based on how much those stations pay in license fees. So a commercial station that gets a lot of ad uh, advertising dollars and plays, you know, they're huge stations, they're playing major label stuff. Um, they pay a lo much larger license fee. So ASCAP will monitor them more because the big artists are the ones that are really fighting to get paid. While independent artists like me, if you don't have a major record label and and all these ins in the business, you're not getting played on the, on, radio, on the yeah. commercial radio. Yeah. There's, you know, in the olden days, they called it payola, and now they say there's no payola, but there's, there's, it, it's, you have to be definitely on the inside circle to get any attention there. You can't just have a great record. You have to have money and people and a team and all the stuff behind it. But, um, so independent artists get a lot of radio play on public radio, but public radio being publicly funded, um, not advertising dollars, smaller budgets, and they pay it. So that means they get the luxury of a plan, paying a smaller license fee to the to ASCAP and the other organizations, which means they monitor them less. Which means they l pick up who's actually getting played far less. Far less. Which means the independent mm -hmm. artists make even less. Even less. Yeah. You know. Um, so it's there's there's mixed feelings about all those performing rights organizations because as they fight to get more money it independent artists don't really see it cuz where they're getting ra radio played they really don't get monitored mm -hmm. um it's most of that money is going to the bigger artists whereas and, your your pandora your spotify just like just like us we we monitor every single view yeah, of, of it's track it's all tracked it's tracked yeah, yeah. So yeah. you have a much better time making money off of the Pandoras and the and the Spotify's. Yeah, I mean, I I've, I'll receive regular checks from from online stuff like Sound Exchange is the the basically the performing rights organization that monitors digital airplay, uh -huh. and because it's all traceable, um, I get more regular checks from them than I do from ASCAP. Mm. But then, so ASCAP and BMI and stuff, they have other programs where basically they say if you go out and perform a show. You deserve to earn royalties on you performing your own songs. Right. So they have things where you can submit set lists and stuff, and you get an annual check that that is decent. Um, cool. And it's kind of like the it's not the loophole, but it's kind of their way to say like, well, we know there's all these other people who are out there playing who aren't getting paid from the way the monitoring of the stations, radio stations, is being picked up. Um, and that's that's ASCAP saying that, or who? ASCAP, who is that? BMI, CSAC, they all have programs like this. Oh, you know, cool. it's like ASCAP Plus Awards or ASCAP Live or mm -hmm. BMI Live. I don't know the names of all the programs. So but I mean, it, I mean, it sounds, and that's that's <clears throat> kind of a good faith effort too. You know, we we crack on uh, on publishers and the the recording industry a lot, but the, I mean, that's a that's a good faith effort to realize, like, hey, yeah, we know that the you know the sampling the sampling pool, you know, the way that we do it, it you know, it can cause you to go underpaid or, or mm -hmm. unpaid, you know, if you are getting airplay. So, you know, hey, um, here's here's a way kind of around that. that yeah. That's, a, you know, that's that's a bright mark, you know, yeah. you could say at that point. So it's, it's, and I don't know how else to do it. You know, it's like they obviously can't monitor every station in the country and every song that's being played unless those radio goes all HD and all those numbers and the ISRC codes, which is like the digital fingerprint mm -hmm. on every song, is somehow being transmitted into this database that sorts and figures out who's getting played. But um, yeah, it is a good faith effort, um, but it's kind of like performing rights organizations are out there to, to, you know, make, you know, get money collected for the artists. And they say like, well, for you independents, we're not really getting it, but if We'll pay you if you can give us the, all the information of what you're doing. But uh -huh. the thing is, I could, I could submit all the playlists, uh, radio playlists, when I, when I know that I'm being played on radio stations. There's national databases that archive that stuff. I, could, I, I can't 
send ASCAP a, a master list of all the radio play I've gotten and have them go, oh, okay, we, we see that. Okay, we'll pay you for that. Because right. yeah. it's like, well, that's not the way our monitoring system goes. Yeah. Probably because they're like, we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to handle it if everyone was sending us playlists because then it's more for oh, us yeah. to dig that's, through. And, right. It's horrible. So... That, which is why TV placements are all, another great way for independent artists because Tracking. if you get a song on a TV show, that show is reporting it. They're yep. reporting that one song that's on yep, the episode they have to or whatever. Because, I mean, before they can use it, it's got you have to have everything. Uh, you know, it, it takes us. You know, to get one song, uh, it takes any you know months between like okay, well, we want to try and do this song. We're you know we're working with this publisher. Hey, can we have this? The publisher says yay or nay. It's like okay, well now we got it signed mm -hmm. documentation, and I mean we won't even be we won't even ask an instructor to start learning that song until we know it's in the bag. Yeah. Because we we've actually we've actually jumped ahead on a couple. I actually have um, I have actually have a couple songs that uh, one I fortunately never actually edited because we were. You know, um, we're like, oh, it's not coming in, it's not coming in. But we paid an instructor to teach it. Um, you know, so that was still money out of our pockets, and the we never got this the sync. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, we can't we can't pay the money and jump the gun and assume that because a publisher publisher initially said, yeah, no, we're we're going to be good, but then mm -hmm. it never came to fruition. I mean, that's you just can't do that. So yeah, if you're if you've got an if you've got your uh, music on a TV show, on an advertisement, stuff like that, it's been paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, it's being tracked. So yeah, that's. I mean, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah. are you going to be with this uh, series you're filming? Is it next week or two weeks from now? Uh, two weeks from now. Um, are you uh, are you teaching some of your own stuff? Or are you using some of your own? Yeah, music I'll be or? teaching some of my own cool. my own stuff, and then other uh, technique things. Everything from you know the, the partial capos to yeah. two hand tapping to right hand techniques, percussive techniques, finger Very picking, cool. um, and uh, and then it, I was telling Jeff, it's the, as the more I'm working on the lessons, the more stuff I'm uncovering. Going well, oh, well, okay, I'd have, I could explain that, and I explain that, and <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, the lesson planning is always fun. <laughs> yeah, it it, ke it keeps uh, fe feeding off itself and growing off itself to mutating. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we don't have that many uh, players like yourself on the site. You know, we, we've got. Well, we've got. I mean, we have. You have Trace and yeah, we got Trace and Bundy. Randall we did the Mar cable Mark stuff. Cruz, and... Khaki King. We've got um, Eric Mongrain. Compared though to. The you know electric guitar rock guy, <laughs> we mm -hmm. we don't have that much. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so that's that's going to be a really awesome addition. No, I'm looking forward to being yeah. part of it. It yeah. should be good. So the the last um the last piece of news that I have uh it's it's almost Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is next week. Yes, Thursday, it is. On Thursday, not a week early. Chris was thinking it was a week early. Well, well, I heard somewhere that it was it was early. Not maybe not a week early, but earlier than normal. Because it falls on Thursday. So what day is Thanksgiving on? Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Well, it's on yeah. Thursday. It's on Thursday, but it's on the twenty first. I think. I think it's the twenty first. So, so it is earlier. Sometimes. I think it feels early day. because like the first of November was like a weekend. And, yeah. Instead yeah. of like having like a full week, week, now it yeah. feels like it's earlier because it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I mean, some some years it's been on like the twenty seventh. Mm -hmm. So it is technically a week early. I was mm -hmm. not wrong. Well, no, it's on, I mean, it's it's always the third Thursday in November, so I mean. But sometimes the third Thursday of November, just like Justin has said, lies later in the month. Yeah, depending on where. Numerically. Yeah, but it's not early, though. If, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go have this debate <laughs> okay. with Jeff. <laughs> if the first of November was on a Friday, Friday, their first Thursday would be, what, the 8th or whatever, yeah, or the yeah. 7th or whatever. You know, so. Now it yeah the number seems a little different but yeah yeah so but anyway so um with with Thanksgiving coming up like the traditional feast is a turkey feast well um PETA has uh has um combined their uh their talents with that of uh, Paul McCartney is this the people eating tasty animals organization yes yeah. yes mm. yeah. um so Paul and I got this from contactmusic.com um, Paul McCartney uh, is urging Americans, of course this is an American holiday, Paul McCartney of course being British, Sir pa Paul McCartney I should say, he is duly knighted I guess I should probably mm. give him that. Um, so he's urging Americans to have a meat free 
Thanksgiving. Um, and so it's like tofu and right, potatoes? Yeah, PETA's claiming that... Um, Brain damage from soy? That it could save 45 million turkeys. That's a lot of turkey. Well, then what would... Who would eat all the turkeys then? <laughs> well, and see, that's, what, that's the first thing that crossed, crossed my mind, though, because we don't eat wild turkey. We're not going out killing 45 million wild turkeys. Right. Mm -hmm. These are turkeys who are gr raised, raised in cages. Raised in, right. yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Right. But I mean, they're we, raised for consumption on Thanksgiving, yeah. primarily. Right. Yeah, we, I mean, we could get into the ethical treatment of animals and raising practices Which and whatnot. Which is and horrific, some, really. There's, yeah, there's certainly some ethical issues there. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's like, but these 45 million turkeys that are going to be used to, to feed Americans, they would not exist in the first place had we not bred them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of... For the purpose of being of, eaten. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. were bred for that purpose. So... Yeah, I mean, not eating what's already been prepared for you is not doing anything except for creating waste. Well, right. I think the idea would be to the, the ripple effect of like, well, if this year nobody ate turkey, oh, yeah. then there then, might be a right. big clearance of turkey bacon in December, <laughs> and then maybe next year they would not breed as much. If this was a new trend, it would slowly sure. taper. But this year it'd be like, okay, we're not going to eat them, but they're all going to go to waste anyway. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because if, okay, so let's say, so let's say 45 million Americans decide, let's not have turkey. Let's, let's not have turkey. All 45 million of them. Yes. So... There's 45 million turkeys that are now, it's like, okay, well, what are we doing with this? <laughs> at, you know, at this point, it's like, they were made, and, and of course, they, they've already been, you know, as close as it is, they've already been slaughtered. So, I mean, harm, you know, harm's done at this point, damage done. So, now you've got, I guess, you know, you could give some to Mythbusters, they like using turkeys to throw <laughs> things, and I, you know, so there's maybe 10 you can give away ten. <laughs> I I don't know. It's it's one of those, it's one of those things that uh, like everybody's got these uh, everybody's got these ideas about how to make things so much better and like ethical ethical treatment of this and you know let's do this and this, but you don't look at the whole picture. It's like okay, well yeah, like that's a great idea. But what do you do with this? Like once actually that happens, right? Yeah, it's like okay. yeah, it's a nice idea. Yeah, but... it's it's a good idea, but the logistics behind it are kind of a nightmare. Well, not to mention, you know, everybody's always talking about the economy and, you know, what, if people don't buy the turkeys, you know, what, what'll happen then? You know, who's going to lose their job because we didn't buy turkeys? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... Well, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of turkey farming here in uh, northern Colorado. Actually. See, we want people to buy turkeys so that we can still... Help our, help our economy. Right. Don't listen to Paul McCartney. He has enough money. <laughs> <laughs> but no, actually, there was more to this. He uh, he was actually he actually did an advertisement for PETA. He was wearing a a, a t shirt in the advertisement that said they specifically say say no th uh, say no say no thanks to turkey go vegetarian. Hmm. So I mean, I didn't know that PETA was pushing vegetarianism. I mean, they've always been for the ethical treatment of animals. Hmm. But I didn't know that they were pushing vegetarianism at this point. Yeah, that's interesting. Are you a vegetarian, Justin? No, I love meat. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, ha I gotta have me a dead cow. I, I, I really do. I, you know, I'm not as much of a red meat eater. I, I do like, you know, the occasional burger. But me, it's chicken. I just, mm -hmm. I love chicken. Bacon. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you can't, you can't do that every day, but <laughs> sure. You know, if cooked right, though, bacon is actually very lean meat. It's that's not what I that hear. Bad for you. It's when you cook it in its own grease, but that's when it's the best, though, yeah. too, you know. What if, uh, if you cook turkey in bacon grease? Oof. That makes it even better, too. Makes Can turkey we get tur <laughs> I mean, why is there not a bacon-wrapped turkey? I want to the, I wanna go to the store and buy a bacon-wrapped turkey. So we've gone mm -hmm. full circle. Yep. Instead of vegetarianism, we're going <laughs> to do bacon-wrapped turkey. I want a double bacon <laughs> turkey. <laughs> So that's that's news for that. That's news. That's and, news. And quick, someone think of a segue from bacon wrapped turkey into having Justin play a song. Speaking of Thanksgiving, <laughs> would you like to play a song for us? Sure. That has to do with Thanksgiving. Um, I well, since we're talking about food, I can do a song that has something to do with spaghetti. Hey, if right. you're not gonna have turkey for Thanksgiving, you could have vegetarian spaghetti. And listen to Justin you, play this song. You could have, like, gluten-free spaghetti. Perfect. Possibly, with a non-meat sauce. And, like, a tofu turkey. 
Yeah. I yeah. Mean, the just, the Italian still, vegetarian yeah. Asian Thanksgiving brought to you by Justin Roth. Yeah. Let's hear the song. Let's hear it. All right. All right. So this is called Spaghetti Junction. Thank you very much. All right. What well, tuning are you in? Yeah. Uh, I'm in Dad Gad. Dad Gad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is that it, for those you guys can't see this, but his thumbnail is amazing on his right hand. Is that is that a fake thumbnail? The, it's uh, it's acrylic, like the oh, painted okay. on uh, powder and yeah yeah. Uh, I was gonna thing. I was gonna ask you what genetic secret you had for developing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. use all acrylics or do you? No, use... just on my thumb. Okay. Um, and I was actually noticing that uh, I, had, I had broken a nail earlier mm. uh, this week and. There was one note in certain phrases. I was like, where's that note? It's like, oh, that's, that's <laughs> oh, what a broken what... nail is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is Dad Gad your, your primary? That's like my standard. Yeah. And then everything, I've got a bunch of tunes that just deviate from there. But I, I hardly, well, I don't have any songs um, that are in full standard tuning. I'm kind of just, uh, for always being a, a solo player, right. I've kind of always been drawn to getting as much fullness out of the guitar as I can. And so alter tunings give me a little more, uh, you know, expansive sound yeah yeah that's so. really cool well so if people want to hear more of that and they probably do uh where where can they go online what kind of resources can you offer here as we wrap up well um justinroth.com is the is the kind of go-to place and from there there's links to you know i'm on facebook and um uh myspace if anybody uses that anymore but, <laughs> <laughs> um Tumblr and YouTube. I've got a bunch of videos. Um, the music's on iTunes and Amazon. I'm sure. iTunes and Amazon, and um, so yeah, those are kind of the main main places there. And soon to be Jam Play. Jam play. Soon oh. to be. Yes. Very very cool. Yes. 
So I'll be teaching uh, some uh, some of the instrumental songs that I've got, two end tapping stuff, probably some vocal songs as well, um, all in altered tunings. And Very cool. Well, yeah. thank you so much awesome. for thank you for stopping by. Yeah, You're welcome. My that. pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Look forward to working more with you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, Podcast out. Podcast out. We'll see you guys next time. Sayonara. And that's this week's edition of the Jam Play Podcast. We'll be back next week with a new guest and more amazing musical banter. In the meantime, if you have any feedback, please send it to podcast at jamplay.com. Also, be sure to check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash jamplay, and on YouTube, youtube.com slash jamplay.com, and the dot is spelled out. Until next time, 